Yeah, so cows can save the world, which is probably the exact opposite that most people have heard if you listen to mainstream media or any of these movies on Netflix. So let's see, first of all, who am I? Well, I'm not a PhD, I'm not one of these scientists, but I have my own life experience that kind of led me down here. I, five years ago, both my parents are basically gone because of modern chronic disease. And that really woke me up because I was only 31 and I have no parents and it sent me down this path and I've dedicated my life to this. I quit my job and I've talked to over 150 people by now on all aspects of nutrition, regenerative agriculture and all this other stuff and I'm making a film about it. So yes, I am a mechanical engineer trained at UCLA and I think, you know, I've used that background, this technical background to you know, look at things scientifically, and I try to look at all sides of nutrition. So I'm making a movie called Food Lies, and I like that Dr. Eads brought up the Game Changers film because I actually made a film debunking that. And it was the same length as their film, and we put it out on YouTube. So the current perceptions are red meat is harmful to human health, cows are harmful to the environment, and it's unethical to kill animals for food. So these are the major three things that anti-meat activists will tell you, vegan propaganda will tell you, and it turns out that actually none of them are really true once you dig into them. So we're gonna go one by one through those. So I believe that cows can save human health. Red meat is a superfood. People like to talk about you know, berries from the Amazon or you know, some like wacky little you know, gimmick that they try to make money on, but really the superfood is animal foods, and we, we've known this for all of history. So here we have some of the, the foods that the upper Pleistocene modern human diet were composed of. We had an abundance of large fatty animals that we could hunt. Uh, Mickey Bendor wrote a great paper that's published called Man the Fat Hunter, and this is what we did until we either hunted them out or you know there's some other thoughts about some asteroidal impact that could have changed the climate, that could have got rid of these animals. But I'm not gonna go over all the details because Michael Eads did a great job going over the human physiology, but here's one example of how our guts changed. Our small intestine got way longer where we digest you know, animal foods and our colon, the, the large intestine got way smaller where we, we ferment and digest these plant foods. So this is just one example of, you know, when these vegans talk about how we're supposed to eat, our bodies changed. We started processing foods outside of our body. We don't have fangs, we don't have claws, but we start, humans started processing food outside of their body. And I've talked to some great professors about this and we'll be covering this all in the film. So we, we, we're scavengers. So we have a very high stomach acid pH. It's or very or very highly acidic, which is very low. It's a 1.5, which is even lower than some carnivores. And this is thought to be because we scavenged animals, right? We we came in and it was rotting, and we needed this high level of acidity to digest them. So this is a big question to me. Most people know that meat was crucial in development as humans, yet we're told today that somehow it's bad for us. It's really interesting how that works, where. You, you ask the same person this, and they'll say, yeah, you know, I see the cave paintings. Yeah, we ate animals. But then they're like, oh yeah, but it's bad for you. Like, why? Why is red meat bad for you? They can't tell you. So when you start looking at the other side of things, you know, we can show correlation between, oh, you know, people who eat fruits and vegetables are healthy. People who eat grains might be healthy. But that doesn't tell us that the grains are healthy. When you, when you look at the opposite side, what about the reverse correlation? So that's really interesting when you look at Asian populations because they don't have this negative image of red meat. And so in Hong Kong, they eat the most meat in the world. They eat the most animal foods in the world. And guess what? They also have the longest life expectancy. So this is a very hard one for these anti-meat people to explain, right? It's like, why, why would that be? So this is a great study too, that the, the risk of mortality for total meat intake and provided evidence of an inverse association with red meat. 
So this is another great example of why we can't use these correlational studies to try to say that meat is bad. So here's, here's the graph of all the modern hunter-gatherers that we study. 73% of these societies got over 50% of their diet from animal foods. And of course, none of them were vegan, zero. All right, all protein is not created equal. See, I'm, th th these are all the things that no one's talking about. We have beef as this highly bioavailable, easily digestible protein. And beans is just one example of you know, something that's touted as a pretty high protein food. But this is not the case. We can't get all this nutrition. So here's an example of sardines. Beef liver would actually be more nutrient dense. So this surprised me. You, you look at this, like, oh, everyone thinks bananas, orange. Oh, man, these are so healthy for you. When you actually look at the data, this is just USDA data. They actually are just a bunch of sugar and you know, trace amounts of some vitamins. So in my journeys, you know, talking to a ton of people, over 150 people, I talked to Dr. David Klerfeld, who's a member of the working group that decided meat was a carcinogen. And I did a long podcast with him. I had to get special clearance to do this with him. And he told me they were, there was a ton of vegans and vegetarians on the panel. They were ignoring evidence that they did not have the, the interests of science in mind. They purposely did not look at studies. So here we have a visualization of what happened. They, there was actually only 15 studies that showed that red meat were good and 14 that showed red meat were bad. I mean, it's basically a toss-up. So there's also the dif difference between the relative risk and the absolute risk. And so just an example, the, after all these studies they looked at, they only found that the meat and cancer had a 0.18% risk factor. But then when we looked at cigarettes and cancer, when we looked at the epidemiology, it was 10 to 30% risk factor. So this is something that we should look more into. So what, what, what the real problem is, and I think everyone here kind of knows this, it's the processed foods, right? We look at the foods we've been eating for all of history, and we're trying to blame them now for some reason when look at the foods that just came into existence. You know, maybe, maybe that's the problem. So we, we know meat is healthy. We've established this, I think, pretty well. But what about the environment? So here's a lot of these statistics that the vegans will not tell you. So two-thirds of land cannot be farmed, right? So we have all this land that there's no other use for it. I've visited these places. I, I've filmed in northern Canada where the soil is a couple millimeters thick. And there is no way to, to grow crops, but there were thousands of ruminants and you know, cows roaming and getting, eating the grass, and it was perfect for them. So when people say, oh, well, they're you know, using all the land, why can't we just grow plants? Well, we can't. Two-thirds of the land cannot. 88% of a feedlot cow's lifetime diet is inedible to humans. This is another thing. They use, they use, we give them food waste. We give them the leftovers from brewers' yeast. We give them cor like ethanol from corn. And they eat the byproducts. So that they actually do us a service. They take stuff that we cannot use, and they make it into a bioavailable, amazing protein. On average, livestock double the amount of high quality user, usable protein than they consume. This is a great one because if you actually look at all the protein, they, you know, vegans will have these other wacky stats on how, how much it takes to, how much water it takes or how much, you know, protein it takes to, to raise an animal. But actually when you look at it and you look at the actual bioavailability of that protein, we actually upcycle this and it's actually double. And you can check out that study if you want to see. So that's how we do things now. I don't think that's the way we should be doing things, right? I don't think anyone here wants you know, feedlots, even though they aren't that bad, and I've visited them, and they aren't, they're not you know, in prisons. Most, all cows spend the first two-thirds of their life on pasture. But the story here is about health of our soil. So Franklin Roosevelt knew this in the 1930s. And our food system starts with the health of our soil. The health of all our food is, is found from the nutrients in that soil. So here's a great study. White oak pastures is a, becoming famous for 
their regenerative farming, their techniques. And they actually had a whole life cycle analysis of all the inputs that, that go into creating their beef. And they're using these re regenerative methods. And so, yes, there are some belches and gas from the cows, but those are offset by getting carbon back into the soil. This is the story that we should be talking about. So they actually, if you see it says a negative 3.5, so they are actually putting more carbon in the soil than they're outputting. So here's another one when they look at, this was an independent survey, by the way, by a company that was, you know, they did, they actually the same people that did the Impossible Burger life cycle analysis. And so they found that even these plant-based burgers that are supposed to be better for us and better for the environment, I think are way worse for us, have way more ingredients, and they're actually not as good at all for the environment when good, well-raised beef can actually do the opposite and sequester carbon. So to dive deeper into how this works, what is regenerative agriculture? What does that mean? How does it work? Well, when grass grows, there's a life cycle and there's an optimum grazing point where we want the cows to be eating the grass right at that, that cross section. So it doesn't want to be too old, but it wants to be just right in the, the age when it's the most nutritious, but also it's, been, it's going to be stimulated by those cows eating it and it will grow again. So this, so this is called rotational grazing, right? When, when we're going to eat the grass and the timing of it is very important. So this mimics nature, right? So this is, looks kind of like what, you know, the ancient bison might have looked like years ago. And they, they're, they're in packs and they move on the land and they eat the grass and then they move, right? And they move on and it lets it rest and grow back. So now we can do that with simple things like this electric fence. It's solar powered and you can manage a lot of livestock with a simple little wire. So this is what it would look like. You could start the cows in the top right and you move them each day. By the time you get them back around, the grass is, is ready to go again. And this does amazing. This is how, this is like the basics of why rotational grazing works. So there's a guy named Alan Savory that I actually just interviewed and might visit in Zimbabwe who's doing this on a global scale. And he's been doing this for, since the 1960s really. He's talking about holistic management. And this is the stuff that happens when you, when you correctly put cows on grass. Desertification happens when cows are not on land. So this is an example of them you know, just using more cattle on the same area. I don't know exactly how many uh, years this was, but they actually do the opposite of what the vegans will have you think, that they actually improve the soil and they help grow grass back. So we have a huge amount of cropland in the world. People say, oh, well, there's not enough, not enough land to do this. So this is great. Regenerative farming is great. But we don't have enough land to do this. Well, we actually do. For one, if we don't use all this cropland for corn, wheat, and soy, which we know is not healthy for us, we could use some of this land for cows. And then also here is, is some of this, uh, this, these rangelands. So, Vegans will also like to say, oh, there's so much land used for animal agriculture, it's, it's terrible. It's like, no, it's actually good. Like we said, if, like Alan Savory has shown, he did an amazing TED talk, by the way, that you can check out, that animals, ruminants on grass help the soil, and this land cannot be used otherwise. So then we're going to talk about the CO2 and methane argument. I don't have much time to go into it, but this is my high-level diagram of this. Methane is this above ground cycle, right? It, the, the methane goes in the air, it's a short lived gas, it comes down, it, it goes back into the grass, it turns into CO2, comes back into the grass, cows eat it, they burp up some methane. It's, a, it's an above ground cycle. Then we have CO2 and we have these fossil fuels. This is a one way street. This is coming from the ground, it's new carbon that's coming into the atmosphere. So this is what we should be worried about, not the cows. Here's another little tidbit here. So food wastage is a huge part of, of CO2 emissions and climate change and all this stuff. And the FAO says that it's a, a giant thing that we need to look at. 
Well, you know what? Animal foods don't get wasted. People value them, they're expensive, they are highly prized. So, you know, maybe we should be looking at not wasting so many plant foods or maybe we should embrace how great animal foods are. So now, here's another topic that's really hard to get into because it's personal, right? It's, it's ethics, it's I don't want to eat meat because I believe it's bad. So I'm gonna have Tara Couture, an amazing farmstead. Op. She, she has her own farm. She raises all her own animals by hand from scratch. She loves them. And uh, let's play this video real quick. This is from, this is kind of not exactly from Food Lies, but. On our farm, we have some pigs that do their piggy thing in the forest. We have ducks that live on a pond and we have meat rabbits and turkeys and chickens and we have both meat and dairy cattle that are all just solely grass-fed including the dairy cattle and we raise our animals from when they're born until when they die. You know this idea that we can unplug from death, that we can not be a part of this horrible machine of death by opting out by not eating animals. To me, I believe that's a, a stunted thought. We get to the point of discomfort because something had to die for us to live. And so we stop there and decide, well, therefore I'm gonna back up and not eat whatever had to die for me to get there. Well, everything has death around it. Anything that's alive had to die for you to eat. We can say that the natural world has always had it figured out and that we can be in that system and we can mimic systems so that we can have food like with ruminants moving through and stuff like that. Or we can say, I don't like death, so I'm not going to eat things that had to die. And so I'm just going to eat foods that are not from an animal. Unfortunately, to do that, you have to destroy entire ecosystems to grow your food. And I cannot tell you about the amount of life that's around us right now. There's all sorts of birds, there's toads, there's snakes, there's bears back there, there's coyotes back there. And that's just the stuff on the surface. Like we're not even talking about what's going on in the soil and everything else that's around us. So in order for me to grow the food that will not kill anything, I'll have to kill all this. I'm gonna have to strip the soil. I'm gonna have to level everything out. I'm gonna have to steal water out of vast aquifers so that we can irrigate the shit out of this place because it's not gonna have any water retention possibility anymore. I am gonna take all the fertility out of the soil because to level this, I've gotta do that. I will end up with a moonscape. It's death in a plate, there's just no blood. It's the same thing times a million. It's much worse. It's not one animal that who lives a good life, who moves through within a biodiverse system, who contributes to that system the way that whoever created all this figured out long before us, much smarter than us, and that is, is contributing and is part of it just like we should be part of it. We should be part of this too. We're here, we're gone, and while we're here we need to be living as, as close as we possibly can to how we're supposed to be living and that includes our diets. Every time she says that line, I, I get the chills and it really, it's really emotional for me. It's death on a plate, there's just no blood. This is one of the main things I wish the anti-meat activists would understand is there is no life without death. This is a harmonious cycle. This is how nature works. You can't get outside of it. You can stick your head in the sand and pretend you're not killing something, but that's not how nature works. 55 sentient animals lies lost to produce 100 kilograms of usable plant protein. That's 25 times more killings than to produce the same amount of rangeland, rangeland's beef. Over half the mice taken by predators after har harvest, so that's 80% decrease in population. So either they're killed immediately or they starve to death because they don't have their food source anymore. So there's so many more examples of this, of, of people have probably heard this by now, of animals getting chopped up in the combines or we we're diverting huge waterways to create this land to grow monocrops and it kills ecosystems. So many animals die that we can't even calculate 
from the way we do monocrops, corn, wheat, and soy. So the biggest question here is what is the alternative, right? So this is the, the big ethical argument is, well, we need an alternative. We can't just live off of air. So part of the story is that animals are gonna die in nature either way. And it's not a good death. Animals don't just die of old age in an old person's, old cow's home and, you know, get like all their little meals for them and some morphine if they're feeling bad. They get eaten alive or they get sick and die and, or they starve to death. So the, there, there is no alternative. Like if you think about this ethical argument, you have to think about the alternative. You can't just think, well, I don't want an animal to die for me to eat because that's not the question. There's another idea here that we could do cell-based meat, plant-based, you know, slop. We'll throw together in a factory. This does not work either. There are so many inputs. If you think about all the refrigeration, all the shipped in ingredients, the chemicals, the preservatives, all the stuff that's going on to make this meat, it's, it's actually more, I think, if you actually look at all the inputs than it would take to just use regular beef or let alone regenerative, regeneratively grown beef you can throw a cow on a pasture, you have sun, you have grass, and you have food. So I think this is a terrible idea and this is the wrong direction we should be going in. So here's another thing. We're kind of in this little world, you know, we're, we're in America where we have nice air conditioning and this nice conference. But on a worldwide scale, livestock helps the billion poorest people the most. And we can't ignore this. They, they, they rely on these animals for their livelihood. I mean, and they would think it's absurd for the, you to tell them that, oh, eating meat's bad for you, or what are you doing? That's bad for the environment. Like, hey, I'm trying to survive. I'm trying to feed my family. What are you talking about? <laughs> so here's, here's one more. We have another, this alternative. People don't ever think about this. The products made from cattle, you think, oh yeah, we just get beef, and they're like doing all these calculations. Oh, look how much water it takes. Okay, what about all the products that we also make from the, from the animal? We, have, we use the bones, we use the hide. None of the animal is wasted. I mean, it's amazing how many are, there's more than this. I don't know if it's, it's too small for, to read, but there are probably hundreds and hundreds of products that would all have to take synthetic inputs. We'd be using fossil fuels, we'd be using plastics, we'd be using all these other things to try to accomplish this. And that is the exact opposite of what we want to do. So basically, the message is cows can save the world. They save human health. As we presented, Dr. Eads did a great job of, of showing us how through all of history, this is what we've been eating and it continues to be a human health food. Cows can save on healthcare costs. If we just all started maybe eating more beef and maybe we replace the cereal or the bread with some more beef. I'm not saying everyone has to be a carnivore. No, we don't have to be Sean Baker, you know, crushing steaks for breakfast. But we can, we can replace some of these harmful foods and we can change our health. They can change the environment. We can use this land in a different way. We, instead of corn, wheat, and soy, we, we have the land. We have millions and millions of acres. If we could figure out a system uh, some sort of incentive system where farmers could be rewarded for use, you know, some people call like a carbon credit, where if you regenerate the soil, then we can give these people compensation for that. Instead of giving them subsidies for growing corn, wheat, and soy, we can give them subsidies to change their operation to use animals, use regenerative agriculture, rotational grazing, holistic management, whatever you want to talk about, call it. And then lastly, is the ethical part is there really is no alternative. And it's just an, it's an absurd thought. It's sort of this pie in the sky like ideal that, you know, like a vegan in a coffee shop will, will, you know, tell some other vegan in a coffee shop that has never visited a farm, has never, you know, seen this. I, I've been to these farms. I know these people. They, they love their animals. They care for them. It's their number one priority to keep them healthy. Of course it is, it's how they make a living. And of course they're not insane psychopaths. They don't want to hurt animals. So I think the main problem is the disconnection between 
nature and humans living in cities. And, and Tara Couture, the, the lovely woman who I interviewed, is writing a book about death, and she thinks this is the this is like the biggest thing is that we are disconnected from death. If we were all these problems in society are kind of around meat are basically because we are so disconnected in the past before a child would even learn to talk they would have seen dozens of deaths there they would have seen their family kill a chicken or a cow for their food and it would be part of their life now we have vegans in coffee shops trying to say that it's somehow not human and they're trying to rewrite history and that's, that's it, that's my message. I think we should um, not listen to them. And I think uh, I'm making a film called Food Lies and we will be exploring all of these things. Thank you.